And now we begin the seventh canto, chapter one. The Supreme Lord is equal to everyone. Pariksit inquired, My dear Brahman, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, being everyone's well-wisher, is equal and extremely dear to everyone. How then did he become partial like a common man for the sake of Indra and thus kill Indra's enemies? How can a person equal to everyone be partial to some and inimical toward others? Lord Vishnu Himself, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the reservoir of all pleasure. Therefore, what benefit would He derive from siding with the demigods? What interest would He fulfill in this way? Since the Lord is transcendental, why should He fear the Asuras, and how could He be envious of them? O greatly fortunate and learned Brahman, whether Narayan is partial or impartial has become a subject of great doubt. Kindly dispel my doubt with positive evidence that Narayan is always neutral and equal to everyone. My dear King, you have put before me an excellent question. Discourses concerning the activities of the Lord, in which the glories of His devotees are also found, are extremely pleasing to devotees. Such wonderful topics always counteract the miseries of the materialistic way of life. Therefore, great sages like Nadad always speak upon Srimad Bhagavatam, because it gives one the facility to hear and chant about the wonderful activities of the Lord. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto Srila Vyasadeva and then begin describing topics concerning the activities of Lord Hari. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, is always transcendental to material qualities and therefore he is called Nirguna or without qualities. Because he is unborn, he does not have a material body to be subjected to attachment and hatred. Although the Lord is always above material existence, through his spiritual potency he appeared and acted like an ordinary human being, accepting duties and obligations apparently like a conditioned soul. My dear King Pariksit, the material qualities Sattva-guna, Rajoguna, and Tamoguna all belong to the material world and do not even touch the Supreme Personality of Godhead. These three gunas cannot act by increasing or decreasing simultaneously. When the quality of goodness is prominent, the sages and demigods flourish with the help of that quality with which they are infused and surcharged by the Supreme Lord. Similarly, when the mode of passion is prominent, the demons flourish, and when ignorance is prominent, the yakshas and rakshasas flourish. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is present in everyone's heart, fostering the reactions of sattva-guna, rajoguna, and tamoguna. The all-pervading Personality of Godhead exists within the heart of every living being, and an expert thinker can perceive how he is present there to a large or small extent. 
Just as one can understand the supply of fire in wood, the water in a water pot, or the sky within a pot, one can understand whether a living entity is a demon or a demigod by understanding that living entity's devotional performances. A thoughtful man can understand how much a person is favored by the Supreme Lord by seeing his actions. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead creates different types of bodies, offering a particular body to each living entity according to his character and fruitive actions, the Lord revives all the qualities of material nature, sattva-guna, rajoguna, and tamoguna. Then, as the Supersoul, he enters each body and influences the qualities of creation, maintenance, and annihilation using sattva-guna for maintenance, rajoguna for creation, and tamoguna for annihilation. O great king, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the controller of the material and spiritual energies, who is certainly the creator of the entire cosmos, creates the time factor to allow the material energy and the living entity to act within the limits of time. Thus the Supreme Personality of Godhead is never under the time factor nor under the material energy. O King, this time factor enhances the Sattva Guna. Thus, although the Supreme Lord is the controller, he favors the demigods who are mostly situated in Sattva Guna. Then the demons who are influenced by Tamoguna are annihilated. The Supreme Lord induces the time factor to act in different ways, but he is never partial. Rather, his activities are glorious. Therefore, he is called Urushrava. Formerly, O King, when Maharaj Yudhishthir was performing the Raja Surya sacrifice, the great sage nodded, responding to his inquiry, recited historical facts showing how the Supreme Personality of Godhead is always impartial, even when killing demons. In this regard, he gave a vivid example. O King, at the Rajasuya sacrifice, Maharaj Yudhishthir, the son of Maharaj Pandu, personally saw Shishupal merge into the body of the Supreme Lord Krishna. Therefore, struck with wonder, he inquired about the reason for this from the great sage Nadad, who was seated there. While he inquired, all the sages present also heard him ask his question. Maharaj Yudhishthir inquired, It is very wonderful that the demon Shishupal merged into the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even though extremely envious. This Sayujya Mukti is impossible to attain even for great transcendentalists. How then did the enemy of the Lord attain it? O great sage, we are all eager to know the cause for this mercy of the Lord. I have heard that formerly a king named Vena blasphemed the Supreme Personality of Godhead and that all the Brahmins consequently obliged him to go to hell. Shishupal should also have been sent to hell. How then did he merge into the Lord's existence? From the very beginning of his childhood, when he could not even speak properly, Shishupal, the most sinful son of Damagosh, began blaspheming the Lord, and he continued to be envious of Sri Krishna until death. Similarly, his brother Dantavakra continued the same habits. Although these two men, Shishupal and Dantavakra, repeatedly blasphemed the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu or Krishna, the Supreme Brahman, they were quite healthy. Indeed, their tongues were not attacked by white leprosy, nor did they enter the darkest region of hellish life. We are certainly most surprised by this. How was it possible for Shishupal and Dantavakra, in the presence of many exalted persons, 
to enter very easily into the body of Krishna, whose nature is difficult to attain. This matter is undoubtedly very wonderful. Indeed, my intelligence has become disturbed, just as the flame of a candle is disturbed by a blowing wind. O Narad Muni, you know everything. Kindly let me know the cause of this wonderful event. After hearing the request of Maharaj Yudhishthir, Narad Muni, the most powerful spiritual master who knew everything, was very pleased. Thus he replied in the presence of everyone taking part in the yajna. The great sage Sri Naradaji said, O King, blasphemy and praise, chastisement and respect are experienced because of ignorance. The body of the conditioned soul is planned by the Lord for suffering in the material world through the agency of the external energy. My dear King, the conditioned soul, being in the bodily conception of life, considers his body to be his self and considers everything in relationship with the body to be his. Because he has this wrong conception of life, he is subjected to dualities like praise and chastisement. Because of the bodily conception of life, the conditioned soul thinks that when the body is annihilated, the living being is annihilated. Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the Supreme Controller, the Supersoul of all living entities. Because he has no material body, he has no false conception of I and mine. It is therefore incorrect to think that he feels pleasure or pain when blasphemed or offered prayers. This is impossible for him. Thus he has no enemy and no friend. When he chastises the demons, it is for their good and when he accepts the prayers of the devotees, it is for their good. He is affected neither by prayers nor by blasphemy. Therefore, by enmity or by devotional service, by fear, by affection, or by lusty desire, by all of these or any one of them, if a conditioned soul somehow or other concentrates his mind upon the Lord, the result is the same. For the Lord, because of his blissful position, is never affected by enmity or friendship. By devotional service, one cannot achieve such intense absorption in thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as one can through enmity toward him. That is my opinion. A grass worm confined in a hole of a wall by a bee always thinks of the bee in fear and enmity and later becomes a bee simply because of such remembrance. Similarly, if the conditioned souls somehow or other think of Krishna who is Satchirananda Vigraha, they will become free from their sins whether thinking of him as their worshipable Lord or as an enemy, because of constantly thinking of him, they will regain their spiritual bodies. Many, many persons have attained liberation simply by thinking of Krishna with great attention and giving up sinful activities. This great attention may be due to lusty desires, inimical feelings, fear, affection or devotional service. I shall now explain how one receives Krishna's mercy simply by concentrating one's mind upon him. My dear King Yudhishthir, the gopis by their lusty desires, Kamsa by his fear, Shishupal and other kings by envy, the Yadus by their familial relationship with Krishna, you Pandavas by your great affection for Krishna and we, the general devotees, by our devotional service have obtained the mercy of Krishna. Somehow or other, 
one must consider the form of Krishna very seriously. Then, by one of the five different processes mentioned above, one can return home back to Godhead. Atheists like King Vena, however, being unable to think of Krishna's form in any of these five ways, cannot attain salvation. Therefore, one must somehow think of Krishna, whether in a friendly way or inimically. O best of the Pandavas, your two cousins, Shishupal and Dandavakra, the sons of your maternal aunt, were formerly associates of Lord Vishnu, but because they were cursed by Brahmins, they fell from Vaikuntha to this material world. Maharaj Yudhishthir inquired, What kind of great curse could affect even liberated Vishnu Bhaktas? And what sort of person could curse even the Lord's associates? For unflinching devotees of the Lord to fall again to this material world is impossible. I cannot believe this. The bodies of the inhabitants of Vaikuntha are completely spiritual, having nothing to do with the material body, senses or life air. Therefore, kindly explain how associates of the Personality of Godhead were cursed to descend in material bodies like ordinary persons. The great Saint nodded said, Once upon a time, when the four sons of Lord Brahma, named Sanaka, Sanandan, Sanatan, and Sanat Kumara, were wandering throughout the three worlds, they came by chance to Vishnu Loka. Although these four great sages were older than Brahma's other sons, like Marichi, they appeared like small, naked children, only five or six years old. When Jai and Vijay saw them trying to enter by Kuntaloka, these two gatekeepers, thinking them ordinary children, forbade them to enter. Thus checked by the doorkeepers Jai and Vijay, Sanandan and the other great sages very angrily cursed them. They said, You two foolish doorkeepers, being agitated by the material qualities of passion and ignorance, you are unfit to live at the shelter of Madhudvisha's lotus feet, which are free from such modes. It would be better for you to go immediately to the material world and take your birth in a family of most sinful asuras. While Jai and Vijay, thus cursed by the sages, were falling to the material world, they were addressed as follows by the same sages who are very kind to them. O doorkeepers, after three births, you will be able to return to your positions in Vaikuntha, for then the duration of the curse will have ended. These two associates of the Lord, Jaya and Vijaya, later descended to the material world, taking birth as the two sons of Diti, Hiranyakashipu being the elder and Hiranyaksha the younger. They were very much respected by the Daityas and Danavas, or the demoniac species. Appearing as Nishingadev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Hari, killed Hiranyakashipu. When the Lord delivered the planet Earth, which had fallen in the Garbodak Ocean, Hiranyaksha tried to hinder him, and then the Lord, as Varaha, killed Hiranyaksha. Desiring to kill his son Prahlad, who was a great devotee of Lord Vishnu, Hiranyakashipu tortured him in many ways. The Lord, the Supersoul of all living entities, is sober, peaceful, and equal to everyone. Since the great devotee Prahlad was protected by the Lord's potency, Hiranyakashipu was unable to kill him in spite of endeavoring to do so in various ways. Thereafter, the same Jai and Vijay, the two doorkeepers of Lord Vishnu, took birth as Ravan and Kumbhakarna, begotten by Vishrava in the womb of Keshini. They were extremely troublesome to all the people of the universe. 
my dear king, just to relieve Jai and Vijay of the Brahmin's curse, Lord Ramachandra appeared in order to kill Ravan and Kumbhakarna. It will be better for you to hear narrations about Lord Ramachandra's activities from Markandaya. In their third birth, the same Jai and Vijay appeared in a family of Kshatriyas as your cousins, the sons of your aunt. Because Lord Krishna has struck them with his disc, all their sinful reactions have been destroyed, and now they are free from the curse. These two associates of Lord Vishnu, Jai and Vijay, maintained a feeling of enmity for a very long time. Because of always thinking of Krishna in this way, they regained the shelter of the Lord, having returned home back to Godhead. O oh my Lord, nodded Muni, why was there such enmity between Hiranyakashipu and his beloved son, Prahlad Maharaj? How did Prahlad Maharaj become such a great devotee of Lord Krishna? Kindly explain this to me. Thus ends the first chapter of the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, The Supreme Lord is Equal to Everyone. <laughs>